Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd on the Street, and today we are taking a look at some command line basics on Linux. Alright everyone, so pretty often in my videos, I will drop down to a command line to perform a quick task. For instance, in my Proton video, I opened up a terminal to update my graphics drivers to make Steam Play work. And very often in the comments of those videos, I'll get people saying things like, you had to open up a terminal to do something, so clearly this program that you're showing off is not ready for mainstream usage yet. It's not ready for average users. Now, I'm not going to argue whether or not Linux should be used by mainstream computer users today, but I am pretty convinced that I need to do a series of videos explaining some basic terminal commands that people can use. Because anytime somebody online sees terminal commands and thinks that using those commands is something that is above their comprehension level, you know, that's really that user cutting themselves off from valuable information or a valuable program or whatever else. In the past five years, uh, Linux has gotten more and more easy to use without needing to open a terminal, but there are some things that it is just quicker to do in a terminal right now. And I think it's going to be that way for a long time because Linux is a modular system with shells at a very low level um, and desktop environments pinned on top of that. So this series is probably going to be boring, maybe redundant for longtime Linux users because you're already going to know a lot of what I'm showing you. But for those people who are new to Linux and who are scared of the terminal right now or don't know how to use the terminal, you know, you can either wait to switch to Linux until every single terminal command has been put into a GUI application somewhere with exactly the options that you need, or you can learn some basic terminal commands, get familiar with it, and then take advantage of all of the other advantages Linux does have over other operating systems right now and not have to wait for anybody to make some cushy GUI program for you. So with that said, this series is going to start out very, very basic, and I'm basically going to be showing the terminal as if I'm showing it to somebody who has never used a command line interface before. And then we'll gradually get a little bit more um, comprehensive and show some things that are useful for advanced Linux users or useful for people who are digging in a little bit further into their computers. So that's just a quick introduction to the series. This intro will not be quite as long in the other videos in this series. I just wanted to explain what I'm doing here. You know, I've made some videos that were very command line heavy before, like my Nextcloud setup and things like that, but a lot of my desktop Linux videos, I don't always focus on the terminal, uh, but I'm not afraid to open it up for a second if I need to, and that's just like how I use my computer. You know, by default, I use a lot of GUI applications, but I'm not afraid to get in and use the terminal if I need to do something quickly. So without further ado, let's cut to the desktop. Alright everyone, and here we are on the desktop, and I do have my terminal open here. Now for this series, I'm going to be using my favorite terminal emulator. It's called Console, and it's part of the KDE suite of applications. However, it really doesn't matter what terminal you're using. You can use GNOME Terminal, you can use Mates Terminal, you can use Xterm or Cool Retro Term or a number of other terminal emulators. What's important isn't which terminal emulator you're using, but it's the shell that you're running. And this series, like most of the videos on my channel, is aimed toward people using desktop Linux, so we are going to be taking a look at GNU Bash, and we can see which shell we're running in a couple of different ways. Uh, we can echo out shell here to uh, to see that our default shell is bin bash, and then we can also echo out zero to see that the currently running shell is bin bash. These two things are environment variables. We'll talk about those in another video. You don't need to know what that means yet, but I just wanted to demonstrate we are running GNU bash, and that's why a lot of people call it GNU slash Linux and not just Linux, because desktop Linux does use a lot of GNU software uh, right down to the command line. So I did want to demonstrate how to view the shell you're using because that is literally the program that we are typing into right now. Even though the window says console, we're actually using bash. So the first thing I want to show you guys and what we're going to be focusing on in this video is how to navigate around your system in the terminal. Because using the terminal is, it's an interface for your system and I think it's gonna make you more comfortable if you're able to tell where you are on your computer. That way in the future when I'm showing you how to do things, you'll also know where you're doing them from. So when you open up a terminal, you're probably going to be put into your home folder by default. And we can see which folder or which directory we are in right now by running a command called PWD. It stands for Print Working Directory. A lot of these commands are very short to make it easier to type, but it is 
is helpful to know what the command actually stands for because it helps you remember which one does which thing. So print working directory is going to show that we are currently in slash home slash Jacob. Now just for demonstration purposes here, I do want to show you what my home folder looks like right now. This is slash home slash Jacob opened up in Dolphin, which is a GUI file manager. And I'm showing you this because I want you to make the connection between the terminal and the GUI here and realize that it's the same thing we're dealing with. One way is just viewing it with icons and the other way is viewing it with text. But you can see all these different folders here. I've got AUR, I've got a Bitwig Studio folder, I've got all of the default XGG directories, I've got some extra ones like files from my school projects and a VMware folder. So we can come back to our terminal and there's a command we can use to list all of the files and directories within the current directory. That command is called ls, it stands for list, and you're going to be using this a ton. So if we just run ls, this is what we'll get. As you can see, this is a list of folders that are in the current folder that we're in. As you can see, it is the exact same folders I just showed you in the GUI. It's AUR, Bitweek Studio, Desktop, Documents. This is the same home slash Jacob that we were just looking at. So that's one important thing, you know. Once again, this is obvious for anyone who's used a terminal before, but for those people who are afraid to open it up or allergic to typing in commands, it's it's the same computer, you're using the same system, you're in the same folders, you're just interacting with it in a slightly different way. Now this does not look very clean, it might look fine right now when we've only got a dozen or so folders, but when you've got a lot of folders, you're not going to want to look at it just by typing ls. We can type in ls-l for long to get a vertical listing, which is easier in my opinion to see and sort through. It's in alphabetical order still, but it's not split up into multiple rows. And in addition to the fact that it's a vertical list with only one item per line, we also get some basic information about these files or these directories in this case. On the far left, we've got permissions, and we'll go through, I'll do another video about permissions on Linux, but if you just wanna know what this means right off the bat, uh, we've got D for directory for every single one of these, and then read, write, execute, read, blank, execute, read, blank, execute. That means that the owner of this directory is allowed to read, write, and execute this file, even though it's a directory. Um, the group that owns it is only allowed to read and execute, but not write or modify. And then the public guests on the system are also allowed to read and execute, but not to modify. My permissions are actually a bit of a mess right here, I'm realizing now looking at this, but like I said, that'll be another video. Uh, next to that, we'll have some other numbers. The next number is going to be, in this case, the number of items that are within this directory. We're going to have the owner of the directory here. Uh, the owner group of the directory is next. And then we've got the size of each file, which in this case, most of these just say 4096 because they're directories. Finally, we have the date and time that the folders were modified. And finally, the name of the directories themselves. Now, there are some other options we can also use with the ls command that I like to use often. One of those is the a option. If we do ls dash AL, and I'm going to just continue building here. I'm not going to go back to the basic LS and, you know, do one flag at a time. When we type in LS-AL, that's as if we're typing in LS-A plus LS-L. It's just using multiple options at the same time. So LS-AL, the A stands for all here, and the L stands for long. So if we run that, you'll see there's a lot more stuff uh, that shows up here. So what just happened? Why did I get so many more results when I ran LS-AL than when I just ran LS? Well, well, most of these new, actually all of the new results that did not show up before, they're hidden files and folders. And on Linux, hidden files and folders are preceded with a dot in their name. That's the only distinction that makes them hidden. If I renamed documents to dot documents, it would become hidden. And if I renamed dot bash underscore history to just bash underscore history, that file would no longer be hidden. There's no other thing you have to do other than just renaming to hide or unhide a file. But if I come into my GUI file manager here and show hidden folders, you can see there is a lot of stuff just hanging out in my home folder that's hidden. Once again, my home folder is kind of a mess right now, but that's beside the point. The point is, dash A is very useful because it lets you see all of the files. So you never know if it's just going to be one hidden file or a ton. So I do use ls dash al very often. That's kind of my default thing to type in actually when I'm just navigating around my system and I want to see where I am. Uh, there is one more thing we can run though. As you can see, the directories, like I said, are 4096, that is measured in bytes. But especially when we get into larger files, you're not going to want everything measured in bytes. Uh, so we can run ls-alh 
H stands for human or human readable. If we run that, you can see now it says 4K as in four kilobytes. As files get bigger, if you just ran ls-a, you would see this number just grow and grow and grow to these gigantic numbers, and you're not going to be sure if you're looking at 128 megabytes or 1.2 gigabytes. You're not gonna be sure without counting all the digits every single time. So including the H flag makes ls include units, uh, and as files get bigger, it will just change this K to an M for megabytes or a G for gigabytes or a T for terabytes. So this is really a great all-around way to view the current folder, ls-alh. Now some systems, you can try this if you just run ll. Mine does not have it here, but some systems, especially Red Hat based systems, will have an alias built into the system that ll will just run ls-al for you. We can actually set up that shortcut or alias ourselves later. I will cover that in another video. I just did want to mention that. You can try running that on your system. If it doesn't work, you can just run ls-alh manually for now. I'm building up quite a bit of scroll back here in my terminal, and a lot of times that does get to be confusing when we're going back and looking at things. So we can clear our terminal with just clear very easy. So now we know how to list folders. I'm just going to do ls-l again because I'm not worried about the hidden stuff right now. So let's talk about navigation. If I wanted to move into one of these folders right now, I can do that by running cd. That stands for change directory. So if I want to go into the aur folder, for example, I'm going to run cd space aur, hit enter. Now if I do print working directory, you can see I am within the AUR directory. I can list out the files in the AUR directory. You can see this is where I store AUR packages that I install. I also have a spreadsheet where I keep track of them so I know what versions of everything I have uh, without having to go and check my package manager. Now let's say we want to go back to slash home slash Jacob. We can move up one directory by running cd space dot dot. Now in bash, most of the time, one dot is going to indicate the current folder and two dots indicates the parent folder. So if I ran cd dot, I'm going to stay in exactly the same place because I'm just changing directory to the folder I'm currently in. Uh, but if I run cd space dot dot, that's the parent folder. If I hit enter now, you can see I'm brought back up to home slash Jacob. So now I know how to go into a folder, how to get back out of the folder. The last thing I'm gonna show in this video is how to make a folder. So let's say that we do an ls-al, um, actually let's do ls-l here. Let's say I wanna make a new folder. You know, I recently graduated from college, so this school folder isn't really gonna be much use anymore. Uh, from now on, I am going to maybe want to have a work folder. I don't actually need that because I've got a separate work laptop, but if I did, I could make a new directory called work by running make directory, and I like to pronounce these commands as the entire command, but you know, this is spelled M-K-D-I-R, make directory, space, work. And folders on Linux, if you're not aware, are case sensitive, so lowercase work is going to be a different folder than uppercase work, and that's going to be a different folder than all caps work. So make sure that you are aware of that. It can get a little confusing if you have two folders that are named the same word, but with different capitalizations. Um, I would generally avoid that just so you don't confuse yourself. But you can run make dir space work here. And now if we do ls-al, we've got a new folder here called work. I keep running dash al out of habit. Uh, but if we just run ls-l, Let's talk about how to remove a directory so I can show you that one more time. To remove an empty directory, you can run remove directory, that's R-M-D-I-R, space, and then the directory name. Now once again, if I run this with lowercase work, it's going to say no such file or directory. You need to make sure the capitalization is the same. And by the way, directories on Linux and Bash, depending on your configuration of your environment, uh, they'll usually have tab completion. So in this case, all I have to do is type an uppercase W and I hit tab and it types the rest in for me. I'm going to try and avoid using tab completion too much in this series uh, just because it's a tutorial and I like to go step by step. But obviously when you're working on things, you want to use tab completion as much as possible to save time. So we're going to run remove directory work. Now if we do ls-l, you'll see work is gone and now we can make the directory again and it's called work. If we do ls-l, there we go. So we'll move into the work directory. I'm going to do my next video in this series about working with text files. Um, so we're not going to do that on the command line just yet, but for now, just to show you how to delete a directory with items in it, if I come into this work folder and I create a new text file called test.txt, 
Now, if I come over here to our work directory and I do ls, you see test.txt. So now if I come back up out of here and I run remove directory work, you can see it's going to say fail to remove work directory not empty. Remove directory is going to by default only remove a directory if it is empty. It's not meant to remove files. It's only meant to remove directories. So if there's files in the directory, it's going to throw an error. To delete a directory with items in it, you're going to type rm-r and then the name of the directory. And what this is, is rm is the remove command. This can be used to delete individual files. So if I wanted to, I could actually go into my work directory. You know, we've got test.txt. So I could run rm test.txt and it would delete this text file. I don't want to do that right now, but that's how remove works. But to delete an entire directory with files in it, we can run, like I said, rm-r, the name of the directory. And most of the time I like to do dot slash the name of the directory or dot slash the name of the file that I'm working on. Once again, the dot stands for the folder we're currently in. So dot slash work, that means our current working directory, which is slash home slash Jacob, rm dash r dot slash work. So this is slash home slash Jacob slash work. This is optional, but once again, it helps us orient ourselves better. Uh, when we use that. So if I run this now, the R stands for recursive. So we are going to recursively remove dot slash work. And of course, recursive means it's going to remove work and everything within work. If there's directories inside of work, it will remove whatever's inside of those as well. And it will continue doing that recursively until the entire work directory is gone. So we can run that. And now if we do ls dash L, the work folder is gone. Now you want to be very careful when you're running rm dash R. You want to be very careful when you're doing this because you might accidentally end up deleting a folder that's got important files in it um, you know that you didn't actually want to delete so oftentimes when i'm cleaning up my system and i do want to delete a folder what i'll actually do is i'll go into the folder i'll run remove on whatever files i do want to remove and if that's all of them and the folder is left empty then i'll come back out and i'll run remove directory just as an extra bit of safety. It's kind of like having a prompt in the GUI pop up and say, are you sure you want to delete this folder? Um, I like using remove directory when I know a folder is empty because that way if I'm mistaken and the folder is not actually empty like I thought it was, I'll get a little warning about it. It'll say fail to remove and if I do want to remove it, I'll have to type in a separate command. In practice, I still use rm-r quite often, but just when I am actively thinking about it and I want an extra little bit of safety, sometimes I'll do that. So that's everything I wanted to cover in this video. It's already pretty long for such a basic video. Like I said, the next video in this series will be working with text files, but I do want you guys to to leave in the comment sections down below on nerdonthestreet.com, YouTube, and Dailymotion. What do you want to know how to do in the terminal? Is there anything specific that you would like me to cover? Right now I've got a list started that includes working with text files, managing permissions, package management on various distributions, service management, and a couple of other things. But if there's anything you want to know how to do in a terminal that you don't know how to do right now, or any commands that you have seen online before that you found confusing and would like explained to you in one of these videos, leave it down in the comments section like I said. And if this series is helpful to you or you think it might be helpful to others, I would also ask you to consider joining the Nerd Club. Basically, you can support me for just $3 a month and help me make more videos about free and open source software like this one. But for now, that's everything I wanted to talk about. So I'm Jacob Kauf and I'm the Nerd in the Street and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.